It's, it really is good uh, being back here. Uh, my, this is uh, my sixth visit uh, to Singapore. Uh, all of them uh, were related to the development of uh, uh, the Duke uh, NUS. And uh, for me, uh, having seen this from the very beginning, starting as a mere concept in uh, 2002, uh, to see the school, the building, uh, medical students uh, here coming to the talk, uh, to me it's, it's like seeing a child grow up. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud of what I see and I think you all ought to be proud of what's being created here uh, in Singapore. Uh, and the entire complex and the relationship with Sing Health is uh, a beautiful collaboration. Uh, what I would like to do uh, today in the next, uh, oh, let's say 30, 40 minutes or so, is to try to convince you that uh, this is the most exciting time in the history of medicine. The reason being uh, is that we are at the very beginning of the next great transformation of healthcare, uh, and all of you are gonna be part of it. Uh, and I think it's a tremendous opportunity to understand it, uh, and even more of an opportunity to be a part of, uh, of making it happen. So uh, let me start with uh, a, a, a very, very important period of time that uh, some of you uh, may uh, remember. And that is uh, on uh, June 26, 2000, uh, at uh, the White House, there was a very, a very important press conference. Uh, Tony Blair of Great Britain was on the phone and Bill Clinton uh, was there uh, with Francis Collins, uh, who was uh, the head of the National Institutes of Health in the United States, uh, Craig Venter, and it was announcing the initial sequencing of the human genome. Uh, and it was thought to be such a, a wonderful time because for the first time uh, with, uh, at that time, only two or three human genomes, we pretty much had the entire blueprint of what all the exomes looked like. And a lot of people were thinking, gee, this is a momentous time of medicine. And uh, Pre uh, President Clinton uh, said at that time that genome science will have a real impact on all our lives. So this wasn't uh, a, a scientific exercise alone by any means, uh, but that this is going to revolutionize medicine, diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of most, if not all, human diseases. So uh, from June 2000 to now the end of January uh, uh, 2016, I'd like to give you a little bit of a report card. Uh, what it was like at the very beginning, uh, what has happened between that time and now, what is happening now, and what I think will be happening in the next five or 10 years. So we're gonna take a little tour of, uh, of medical history uh, all the way to projecting a bit about what's in our uh, future. So, I think it's very clear, if you think about the practice of medicine, from, uh, from my perspective, there has been one great transformation of medicine that occurred a little bit over a century ago. Prior to a century ago, the basic theory about the cause of disease was that it was due to an imbalance of humors in the body, humors, such as yellow bile or golden bile, black bile, uh, phlegm, uh, what's in the lungs, and the blood. That there were currents in the body, and when they went out of balance, different diseases occurred. Very metaphysical. Uh, it led to uh, therapeutic regimens uh, which were based on moxibustion, trying to remove things from the body at different points and readjusting the balance of the humors. In the very end of the uh, 19th century, there was a confluence <clears throat> of sciences which involved physics, uh, in which the discovery of x-rays led to the ability to have imaging for the first time, rentgenology, Pathology, despite the fact that uh, humors were thought to be 
uh, the cause of disease, pathologists were saying that, let's say a person uh, develops a yellowing uh, of the sclera uh, and they have uh, uh, chalky stools and very dark urines and a large belly, uh, that if you look at the liver, they have cirrhosis, and that cirrhosis is due to specific changes in the cells and the structure of the liver. So it was becoming much more fact-based than a metaphysical theory. Physiology, understanding how blood pressure worked, how various uh, uh, organ systems worked. Chemistry, uh, at the very uh, end of the 19th century, early 20th century, with uh, Ehrlich, and Fisher started uh, refining the field of organic chemistry. So for the first time, one can synthesize molecules <clears throat> rather than extracting essentially aspirin uh, from, uh, from a bark, uh, one could start synthesizing uh, putative uh, uh, chemicals that could be used as therapeutics. <clears throat> and the thought was one could develop a silver bullet uh, for the treatment of syphilis, which was a major disease at the time. And then most profoundly, uh, the discovery that a number of diseases, in particular tuberculosis, very complex disease of the, of the lung, but involving virtually every part of the body, was actually due or could be attributed to the presence of a specific microbe a mycobacterium tuberculosis that was shown uh, almost irrefutably to be the cause of TB. So imagine at that time how exciting it must have been to be in medicine to say rather than dealing solely with metaphysical concepts that are uh, very uh, difficult in any way scientifically to validate, we could start practicing medicine based on pathophysiology. So we started the concept of pathophysiology of disease. And the basic uh, direction of medicine was that for every disease there is underlying cause, and let's simplify and try to understand the cause and find it and fix it. So the role of the physician was to find it and fix it. And I would say by and large uh, that is still the concept under which medicine is being practiced. By and large we wait for people to develop disease, and then uh, sometimes with miraculous capabilities, we find it and fix it. However, we are now developing uh, a whole new uh, series of sciences and technologies which are creating a confluence again. Roughly a hundred years later, a century later, we have genomics, which I already mentioned, 2000, the first sequencing of the human genome, uh, metabolomics, proteomics, the ability to measure proteins in virtually any fluid, metabolites in virtually any fluid, concepts of systems biology, and that is uh, bi biological systems work in a dynamic way uh, with mass action equations and, and uh, flows of the Krebs cycle. It's not static, it's dynamic. It's a whole different way of thinking. The ability to harness informatics, collect data, micro and nano processing. It's as though a whole new world, we're given uh, almost a, a, a virtual uh, mask to wear and saying, imagine a whole new world with all of these new capabilities. And this is really, uh, was very influential in my thinking uh, around the end of the 20th century when I was chancellor at Duke thinking, wow, look at all these new capabilities. We, we didn't even begin to think about them 10 years before. How is this going to change medicine? What can we do to make med medicine better? And the feeling was, what this will do for the first time is allow us to predict things before they occur. Rather than waiting for a clinical event, we will have tools that allow the prediction of things before they occur we will also be able to understand mechanistically what is the cause of disease. Most of the definition of disease historically was looking at an individual it is, that is not behaving normally and saying, what does that look like? And gee, you know, we see this often, individuals 
that have certain patterns of swollen joints that are associated maybe with certain rashes and some, some other things. And then after we see this enough, we define it as a disease. So that is a phenotypic description of disease. But it doesn't necessarily describe the mechanism. There may be three, four, five, ten mechanisms that give you the same phenotype. Or there may be phenotypes that overlap, but they're, they're different. I, I'm a rheumatologist. So we define something as rheumatoid arthritis. But every rheumatologist knows there are probably three or four or five diseases there, seropositive, seronegative, uh, with or without ankylosis, uh, with or without nodules. Uh, and we don't know really what the difference is, but we know it's not all the same thing. So we were developing ways to really start thinking about the disease based on the mechanism rather than solely on the phenotype. Uh, so this created a tremendous amount of excitement. Uh, this also uh, created some thinking, given what we know or what we knew back in 2000, how does disease develop? I mean, what is the pattern of a disease developing? And I, I ended up drawing this cartoon once for somebody that we were just bringing into the health system that I was trying to explain in a very easy way what it is that we were thinking about and actually drew on a napkin that for any chronic disease, and I'd like each of you to think about a chronic disease. It could be type two diabetes or it could be cancer or cardiovascular disease, you know, whatever. It develops over time. Uh, each of it may have a different time coordinate. But for most of the development, it's subclinical. As soon as there's a clinical finding, it usually has a crescendo where it gets worse quickly. And there seems to be a basic truth that the longer that one waits, the cost of treating it is more expensive and the ability to reverse it goes down. And we also know that this disease is based on a number of things. One is the genetic background of the individual. You know, I talked about tuberculosis. Uh, if you look at a population of 1,000 individuals that are exposed to the same amount of the mycobacterium deposited in the lung, out of that 1,000, there may be 100 that develop a fulminate form of tuberculosis. Uh, and die rapidly, whereas 100 may develop virtually no symptomatology whatsoever and maybe have a little bit of calcification or swelling of a lymph node that is only picked up on x-ray and then everything in between. So we know that there is a combination of genetic inheritance plus environmental exposure, what a person does, what they're exposed to over time that results in disease. Now, a very striking factor of the healthcare system, uh, certainly in uh, Western medicine, is that despite understanding this, the evolution of disease, the main focus of the entire healthcare system, it's, it's changing a bit, but the main focus has been to treat uh, at this portion of the curve, to wait until the patient comes in and then to treat. But what we began envisioning around uh, the first time I talked about this publicly was at the year 2002 uh, at the Association of American Medical College National Meeting and uh, described this conceptually, why are we taking care of health care uh, over here when we know that now three quarters of our expenses are taking care of people with preventable complex chronic diseases? It makes no sense. So let's try to move the arrow to the left. And what I argued is that if we just focused medicine with no new technology, but focusing on the earliest clinical detection of disease, and focusing on that with both the physician and the patient, we could move the curve to the left. But with these new capabilities, uh, if we know the earliest molecular sign of disease, we could start picking it up over here. And then look what was happening now. It's taken a little bit longer than what we thought. But with genomics and doing massive genomics and following people over time and understanding the impact of genomics on susceptibility, we could start calculating risk 
at time of birth. Or if you want to get into a fantasy world, even before. So this was a, a whole new exciting world of why are we practicing reactive healthcare when we can make healthcare proactive and personalized and preventative. So that was the concept. Another piece of this concept, which I think is very important, think of this, what we call the inflection curve. Well, let me, uh, before I get to that. So if you think about th the way medicine could be practiced if we focused on this approach to health and disease, you could think of a focus on treating people as we're doing now, when they have a disease, but the way we would do it <clears throat> is to define their disease more mechan mechanistically, personalize their therapy wherever we could. And now it's called precision medicine. A lot of the initiatives of precision medicine are how we make the therapy more precise to the needs of the individual and have more coherent uh, functions of disease management. But what was really exciting was moving to the point where uh, with health enhancement and primary prevention, primary care, and even public health measures prior to primary care could get people involved in understanding their health care risks and being very involved in preventing disease before it occurred. So this is a revolutionary approach to health care, and we called it personalized health care. Other people called it P4 medicine. It has a number of different names. Uh, I'll get into this a little bit more at the end. Uh, but this is the general concept. But beyond that concept, and, and this is a point that has been very heavily overlooked, <clears throat> is a tremendous opportunity to improve health. If we think of the basic structure of this inflection curve, and you think about how it can be changed by what the individual does, or what the environment is like. If you just take theoretically uh, cardiovascular disease with the development of a, of a myocardial infarction, and you say most MIs plus or minus may develop uh, when a person is in their 50s or early 60s, but depending on what they do with the same risk, uh, if they have a diet that is a, a very negative diet for cardiovascular disease, if they're a couch potato, high degree of stress, smoke, you know, whatever, they could easily shift the curve to the left and have a heart attack when they're 40. On the other hand, uh, with the same susceptibility, if they do everything right, uh, go on the Dean Ornish diet and, and meditate three times a day and, you know, do all, avoid smoking and everything else, uh, exercise, they may very well be able to bring the curve over here where their first heart attack won't occur until they're 110. And by, by that time, may not may not matter. So uh, bringing in the idea of what the individual does and having people very much involved in their own health care becomes extremely important. Okay, so you know, let's get to the idea of what are we dealing with in terms of a major change in health care? Uh, what 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 does a health care revolution look like, uh, particularly? Uh, if a lot of it is technology-based. So I just want to introduce this concept to you, keep it in your mind as we go through this. We're talking about disruptive technologies, the ability uh, to sequence uh, human genome you might be a disruptive te technology. But think of disruptive, uh, disruptive technologies, but the technology is limited in value unless it's applied. So how do we take this no uh, technology and put it into an application. And that, I would call, is a disruptive innovation. But at some point, when there is enough of a mass of uh, civilization using a disruptive innovation, it sometimes changes the entire way that the world works in that area. And that's a paradigm shift. So, you know, to give you a, almost a silly example, uh, the horse and buggy days. Uh, the development of, you know, people were perfectly satisfied with that. Maybe not, but let's say most of them were. Uh, the development of the internal combustion engine. That was a disruptive technology. But applying that to the automobile was a disruptive innovation. 
Now, the fact that uh, most people, maybe not in Singapore, you may not need it, but in many places, everybody has an automobile. Uh, that is a paradigm shift in transportation or the use of uh, smartphones. Uh, you could think of your own examples. So let's think about that a bit as we think about the practice of medicine. And let me give you an example, a clear example of a disruptive technology. Uh, at the time of the announcement uh, by President Clinton of the initial sequencing of the human genome, uh, and it wasn't a full sequencing at that time, uh, the cost, at least on the federal government side, was roughly, uh, it was many, many, many hundreds of millions of dollars per genome. Look what happened with the, the development of next generation sequencing. That was a whole different way of sequencing, rather than sequencing one of a time, massive parallel sequencing. This was a disruptive innovation. You can see it's kind of tailed off and maybe happened again. So this is a disruptive innovation. Now the cost of whole genome sequence, let's say whole exome sequencing is about $1,000 per person. That is unbelievable in this period of time. That's a disruptive technology, but is it a disruptive innovation? Not yet. You know, what do you do with it? So the disruptive innovation will come from the ability to understand what this means. Uh, and then, when you start applying it, this will be a disruptive innovation, and if it ever changes totally how we practice medicine, it'll be a paradigm shift. So think about that in terms of orders of magnitude. And some of the examples, and I, I hope that I create some excitement in your mind, and many of these things may be very second nature to you, but none of these things pretty much existed uh, at the year 2000. Uh, well, they did uh, in, in very crude forms. But the idea that we might be able to have health risk assessment for people, this was a totally foreign concept in medical care, that rather than looking at an individual's disease, let's predict uh, and use as part of our practice what their risks are susceptibility markers, whether a person is susceptible to disease or not, the pathological pathways, particularly as it relates to cancer, the level of disease uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, having a very fine, um, highly quantified way to determine how active somebody's disease is. So when you treat, you could use this as a very objective guide. Uh, drug metabolism, this has been around for a while, not very well used, but uh, uh, fast metabolizers, slow metabolizers used for warfarin and other drugs. The concept of targeted therapies. When I first started talking about this, the pharma industry would not even mention there is something other than blockbuster drugs because the thought was everybody would sell their stock in GSK if they knew they were after drugs that were targeted. Uh, and then having diagnostics that allow you to have drug selection uh, and then being able to predict people who have, have adverse reactions to chemotherapy. These are all new disruptive technologies. But the innovation is when we start applying them to practice. So for each of these technologies, we have to say, what is the innovation in healthcare? Uh, and are we taking advantage in healthcare of the technology to apply it to how we're practicing? Okay, so uh, let me move on a bit because I don't want to run out of time. Uh, giving a, essentially a report card or where we are with uh, personalized or genomic medicine. Major advances uh, have been the development of these disruptive technologies. No doubt about it. They have profound capability of altering how we deliver care. The application has been most profound in the treatment of cancer. And here it really is going beyond disruptive technology to innovation. It is almost not quite a paradigm shift that when an individual develops cancer, at least in the United States, and I suspect it's the same here in Singapore, we feel beholden to try to determine what are the drivers 
of that person's cancer and, and is there a targeted therapy available to them. So uh, a very big focus on the genomics, the proteomics, understanding the pathways that are driving the disease, uh, molecular networks, and then using targeted therapies. So I say, you know, here we have a clear disruptive innovation verging on a paradigm shift uh, in treatment of a, of a given disease. And the pharmaceutical industry has been irreversibly in, in, in the more innovative parts of the pharma and biotech industry is towards the development of targeted therapies. Understanding the mechanism and dealing uh, with treating the mechanism, specific mechanism of the disease. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, Herceptin, I'm proud to say, which was really the first targeted therapy, I was fortunate enough to be at Genentech at the time and head of medical R&D when we put this into development. Although at that time, we really didn't have a clue that this would ever be successful, and uh, I personally was very doubtful. And I remember telling my boss, the head of Genentech, Bob Swanson, that we wanted to develop a very expensive drug for cancer based on monoclonal antibody, which had never been used, that at best would treat one-third of patients with cancer, him looking in disbelief and saying, would you explain to me again why are you doing this? Uh, it made no sense at the time, but this is a whole new area. Now, in one of the questions that I was asked to address in this talk, and I will just uh, mention this very briefly, is personalized medicine just a more expensive way of practicing medicine that uh, is a fad and uh, is, is not cost effective for populations? This is a slide of uh, new drugs. Uh, many of the drugs are thought to be targeted in some way or another. But look at the percent of responders to non-responders. And think about the, the cost of these drugs. In, in, in my own field, in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, you know, there are some uh, drugs that, that we use uh, that cost uh, many tens of thousands of dollars. And yet, we know that in rheumatoid arthritis, the anti-TNF antibodies, at best 40% of individuals respond. So being able to understand responders versus non-responders is a real challenge, and once we understand it better, will be far more cost-effective. I think somewhere in here is Gleevec, uh, which has a very high ratio of responders to non-responders, uh, and uh, the reason being is that it's very, in, in a way, very easy to tell who are the individuals that have the appropriate defect that should respond to Gleevec. And those that do, every one of them responds, but there are breakthroughs in individuals who have emergent mutations. So I think it gives us a tremendous degree of optimism. But this is just the beginning. I mean, this is so exciting to be in medicine at this time because in addition to the targeted therapies that we're talking about, antibody drug conjugates, like for example, Herceptin, which we were working on, Herceptin having a toxic moiety and using the antibody to focus the toxin on the cell, uh, this is now already very far into development. Uh, it was still early in cell therapy, but gene therapy after having a quiescent period of two decades until uh, we learn better how to deal with vectors and how to deal with safety. Now gene therapy is coming to the forefront again. And one of the most exciting areas is immunotherapies, uh, uh, antibodies or strategy, uh, strategies against checkpoint inhibitors and harnessing the power of the immune system to be able to recognize myriad uh, variations of cancer and being able either alone or uh, with uh, collaborative therapies uh, to be uh, a very effective treatment leading to cures. And then, to some degree, most of all, and I'm uh, really excited about the PRISM program ongoing here uh, in uh, Duke NUS uh, with Sing Health, uh, looking at 5,000 individuals, following them in terms of their genomics, and being able to aggregate data around it 
to understand what are the mechanisms of phenotypic expression based on the analysis of massive amounts of data is going to increase progress very dramatically. So my uh, assessment of healthcare from 2002 to 2016 has been we have been incredibly successful in the technology. We have been quite successful, quite good in the application of new therapies and diagnostics, but still very heavily focused on cancer, but an idea of what the power of this new technology is. But the big unfulfilled promise is, how are we actually practicing medicine? Are we moving from the practice of medicine, which was the way that I was trained, and I met a whole bunch of first year medical students at uh, Duke NUS, and to not entirely, but to a large degree, the way you're being trained, and that is to understand the root cause of disease. That's important, but it's not sufficient. To really move from the dy dynamic that the role of the physician is to find it and fix it, to say that the role of the, of the physician is to find it and fix it, but also to prevent it. And to prevent it in collaboration with the patient, and when they fix it, to fix it with precision. So what we're trying to do is to move from the chief complaint-oriented approach to in primary care, a concept that we call personalized health planning, where with each individual, we try to understand with them and their uh, point in their life, what are their most proximate health care risks, how do we develop shared goals between the patient and the provider to mitigate the risks? How do we track progress and how do we coordinate care? With disease, it is having uh, essentially the workflow and the dis discipline that, for example, if somebody comes in, I use the example, 29-year-old uh, year old man that comes in with a lump under his arm, is, is an axilla. And this could be a neoplasm, uh, it could be an, inf an infection, a number of different things. How do you start with a workup that gives you the most precise diagnosis, the most precise selection of therapy, the most precise evaluation of the likelihood of devastating side effects, get patient engagement and continuity of care? So this is what we're trying to develop as a healthcare model. So you, this could be applied to health enhancement and well-being enhancement, primary prevention, secondary prevention, disease uh, care and management. And the basic process is uh, health evaluation, health risk assessment, creating engagement on the part of the patient, developing therapeutic uh, wellness plan with shared goals, tracking, developing metrics, what are you going to follow? Is it going to be hemoglobin A1C, lipid levels, BMI, blood pressure, you name it, uh, tracking it, and then having coordination. And the coordination may involve um, uh, M Health, mobile health, and digital uh, types of electronics. And it's getting exciting as to how much information could be put in the hand of the patient. Uh, or the individual uh, and the communication of that with the healthcare system. So the entire new models of healthcare delivery. And quite frankly, as we've had discussion uh, today uh, with uh, uh, Duke Health, Sing Health, collaboration, the Academic Medical Center in Singapore, I think one of the real opportunities for the Academic Medical Centers in Singapore is really to embrace that they could be at the leading edge of developing new models of healthcare delivery. Uh, because I do believe it's gonna be easier to do it as hard as it is in Singapore, it's a lot easier than it is in the United States because we have so many perverse incentives and bureaucracies that make it difficult. Okay, I'm gonna move a little bit more quickly now. This is what the clinical workflow looks like in personalized health planning and personalized health care. This workflow is the, is the outcome of a large series of pilots 
our group did, uh, our Center uh, for, for Personalized Health Care did with the Veterans Health Administration in the United States. So the way the primary care workflow looks like, and this does work in a busy VA setting, is that you start uh, thinking about what is the role of the patient, what is the role of the physician and the physician team. And before the patient is even seen for, let's say, their annual physical, they undergo a personal health inventory and awareness that seeks to increase their own awareness of their health, what they want their health for, the status of their health, and they actually fill out, fill out a personalized health inventory that we use as a risk assessment tool, uh, not only to get information about their health, but an understanding of how prepared are they to be a participant in their health care. The physician does their usual workup in terms of a clinical assessment, but also has the availability, wherever possible, of risk assessment tools so that what they determine, as well as the information they get from the patient, which is given to them at the time of the visit, they have a pretty under, a good understanding of what are this individual's proximate risks over the course of a year, what are the goals, therapeutic goals, and how do they merge these into shared goals with the individual. So they have clearly articulated shared goals that are committed to by the patient. They commit to what are they going to track. Uh, if it, is it, is it going to be BMI or is it going to be various other things that they're willing to track? Uh, and we put it down into a plan and then we figure out how we coordinate it and follow up. Very important to this is shared goal setting getting patients involved in their care. In, in disease care, I'm not going to go into this, but you will have a copy of this if you want it. We put together a decision tree that reflects what physicians actually do when they work up a patient. You know, think about that 29-year-old man with a lump under his arm. The differential diagnosis is tremendous, and the physical ex exam can give you some hint as to whether this is neoplastic or infectious or not, but you're just beginning. And there is a decision tree that every physician does without necessarily realizing that they're doing that. But rendering this formally as to a clinical workflow and understanding what are the uh, precision tools that could be used to enhance this workup, either in the diagnosis or selection of therapies uh, or selection of whether a therapy is working can actually be rendered into a workflow that could be put in as part of the electronic medical record that allows physicians to have access to the greatest standards of care and the availability of precision di diagnostics if they need them. Is this theory? It's beyond theory because one of the things that I did when I stepped down as chancellor was create a company that actually developed this for cancer in collaboration with NCCN, which writes all the cancer uh, guidelines. And this is the basic core of the practice of US oncology. They have a simplified, uh, but this kind of workflow. Okay, so uh, I wanna end up uh, by uh, trying to clarify just to some degree what has to be confusing to anybody in the field uh, that tries to follow up. And that is, when you say personalized medicine, what is it? Uh, an awful lot of people will say, well, personalized medicine is genomic medicine. And you don't need to worry about personalized medicine because it's genomic medicine, and genomics is really not going to impact medicine in a big way for the next 10 years. So let's get on to something else. Uh, and quite frankly, that's been one of the biggest burdens that I've had uh, to deal with is the fact that most people blow this off as being futuristic, expensive, uh, pie in the sky. And a lot of it is if you believe that personalized medicine is genomic medicine alone. What is precision medicine? Well, a lot of people who got frustrated with this said, uh, well, this may or may not be good. and, and uh, even if we think about genomic medicine, we know that 
the world is not a series of n equal one. Uh, I mean, not every patient is totally unique. And even if they were, we can't treat them as being unique. So let's bring to bear all the tools that are precise tools to the need of that patient. And I think that actually is quite a bit of progress. Uh, it, it makes more understandable the application of these two into a healthcare model. But I say that this is good but insufficient because it really does focus on precision in the diagnosis and treatment of disease. We need that, but the real opportunity is to go beyond that to anticipate disease before it occurs, understand that health, and I ask you, each of you, without pointing to somebody, what is health? What is health? The usual answer that a medical group will give is health is the absence of disease. But I ask you to think about it. Is health merely the absence of disease? Uh, the answer obviously is no. It's much more than that. Uh, but the ability to focus not only on preventing disease but enhancing health, this is an emerging area of excitement uh, in medicine today. So personalized health care, and I'm not going to go over this in detail, but I will make sure everybody has access to the slides. But personalized health care is the amalgamation of using personalized precision tools as well as conventional tools and putting them together in that personalized health plan that I described, which is predictive, sets goals, a way to reach goals, and how to coordinate care. When that is put together, when the personalized health care is put together with a coordinated way so that the individual has support as they need it with the health care system, the entire aggregate is personalized health care. Okay, my time is just about out because I want to leave time for questions. So let me summarize uh, with uh, what I showed a couple of days ago. Uh, but I believe is firmly true, and I tell this uh, from my own scars that I have, you know, covered with my clothing, how difficult it is to try to cause a revolution in healthcare delivery. When I started uh, thinking about this, and in, in no way is it me, it is a very large cohort of colleagues at Duke and beyond Duke. When we started thinking about this, and the first time it was ever talked about was in 2002, uh, and then we had several publications with Sandy Williams, uh, who was dean here, um, and uh, Hunt Willard in Science and other journals in 2003. We thought that this was so obvious that there would be a transformation in healthcare delivery in a short period of time. Well, it hasn't quite happened yet. So I quote to you the words of Machiavelli, uh, there is nothing more difficult to plan, more doubtful of success, more dangerous to manage than the creation of a new system, a new healthcare system. The initiator, us, and I'll put you under the big Duke umbrella, uh, that we want to create personalized healthcare. So the initiator has the enmity of all who profit from the old institution, and in many ways that's us. I mean, if I look at Duke, health system, if, as chancellor, if I were able to say, which I really couldn't, starting tomorrow we're all going to practice personalized health care and we're going to move to personalized health care, the Duke health system would have been broke within three years. You know, you just couldn't afford it the way health care was reimbursed. So uh, the people who benefit from the old way of doing it uh, won't move, and the people who benefit from the new way aren't there yet, uh, so they have to take it as a matter of faith. So it takes longer than you could ever imagine. But I leave you with the final thought, and this is my challenge uh, to the leaders of healthcare in Singapore, and that is uh, the misconception of, of Darwin and evolution. Most people think that uh, the strongest are, are, it's the strongest that survive, the strongest. It's not the strongest that survive. I mean, if you think of uh, the dinosaurs and various other entities, none of them survive. It's the ones that are most adaptable to change. So from me looking from the outside, maybe with one toe into Singapore, because I, I love this uh, place, um, 
I think what you has a, have is a tremendous advantage over virtually any other system is the ability to change. Now, I know it, you could look at me and say, well, he doesn't really know what it's like here. And I'm sure I don't. And I know it's, it's got to be a lot more difficult. But I really do believe, and I'm sure Tom will tell me uh, after he's either now or when he's been here another year or so, uh, I think it's going to be a lot easier than the United States. Uh, but I, I think the opportunity for the academic health center here in Singapore is tremendous. Because if you think about all the things that we love to do in biomedicine, research, discovery, technology, uh, every form of ca uh, patient care, new models of patient care, clinical research, outcomes, epidemiology, public health, you roll them all together and you say, well, we don't know what the solution is, and it may be different in different areas uh, of the country, but let's say one of the things that's the byproduct of the intellectual capital that's generated here is the development of new models of healthcare. So that is a challenge I leave to you. Uh, and when, and hopefully not too long, I come back again, uh, we will address what is the progress you made uh, from, uh, uh, what is it, January 29, 2016 until whenever I get back. So thank you very much.